Thanks to Leather Honey for sponsoring today's video. This is where the Daytona cars came from. How did he end up getting out of his contract to go to Yates? What was he the mechanics told me, of that? He said, and I said, if you can't afford to do that, you, you don't need to be doing this. There was things that I could have done different. Uh, when was the last time you stood in this parking lot and walked around? 86. So you haven't been back here since 1986? Make some test runs through here? Oh, yeah. No one cared? <laughs> well, they, they may have. They didn't say anything. We, <laughs> we were outside of Bristol, Virginia, riding in a 1960s Volkswagen bus, about to see the entire storyline of Morgan McClure Motorsports. Pretty cool. I like this air conditioning. What? <laughs> so we were in the parking lot of the very first Morgan McClure race shop with Larry McClure. How many times in your lifetime do you think people thought there was one owner and his name was Morgan McClure? <laughs> Probably a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not sure, but so, I never thought about it. I have a, uh, I have a niece that her name's Morgan McClure. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So if those who didn't know, this is the McClure side of Morgan McClure as two guys. Yes. Yeah. And this is your very first building. Very first building, two bays. Had a little in the office. There was a little mezzanine upstairs we used for storage. When did you move in here? Moved in here in uh, 80, 84, 84. Yeah. 1984. 1984. So when you when you started the team or you bought out GC Spencer's stuff, did you buy this place right away, or did you run out of well, his garage first? We ran out of his garage first for about six races, and. Uh, we knew that we were going to have to get a little bigger and a little more serious or get out. So we needed a place to work on our cars. We bought we bought this, uh, of course we had the Chevy dealership over at Coburn. Tim and I decided that we need to go ahead and buy this building to have a place to work on the race cars and get it out of the dealership. And keeping in mind, we kind of uh, financed uh, a racing out of the dealership so it took a lot of money back in that day so it was like a, a leap of faith to do that did you did you do it with a business intent or did you do it because you wanted to have we fun we kind of did it because we wanted to do it and have fun but in that time we were going to run just a select races i knew i had to have somebody to run the shop i had gc who was an ex-race car driver and a mechanic and tony glover became available he wanted to come back home from petty enterprises so we talked to him and hired him he was the first crew chief for us if it's if it's 1985 and you're getting ready for a race we had uh, two race cars sitting in here one new one and one old one and then i sold the old one and, and bought another new one so we ended up with two race cars you can see where the building was added onto too. That's where we added onto. You added this on here. What? Um, what did you put in there? Well, we had a parts department. We had uh, storage. We had. We built. Not only did we build that bay, the, the same size as the existing building, but on the other side we built two more bays. So we had a lot more room. So from '84 to '86, you were in here. Okay. And in eighty and in eighty four we had Tommy Ellis as a driver. Eighty five we had uh, Joe Rutman. And and Folgers was our sponsor for Joe Rutman. Uh, Tommy Ellis, it was Morgan McClure pretty much <laughs> sponsor. So was this the building you had when Mark Martin raced for you? No, we when we had Mark we raced out of G C's basement. Really? Yeah. Wow, so that was... What did he race for us? Four races, I think. He raced about four races. Wow. What was this brings back memories? When Remember was that? that old uh, cab over <laughs> Kenworth <laughs> truck that we had, or Peterbilt, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. yeah Paul, sitting out here and going to Daytona, sitting in there at the desk, just hoping the telephone would ring and somebody would want to sponsor the race car. So you had a... And it did. Really? Yeah. Was that a cab over um, box truck or yeah, just semi truck? Yeah, cab truck? over. Had a uh, 671 Detroit diesel in it. Where'd you park it? Wah! Right there. You parked it right at, along that fence there? Yeah. 
Well, over here. When was the last time you stood in this parking lot and walked around? Oh, I guess when I sold it back in uh, 86. So you haven't been back here since 1986? I've been by here. I come by here all the time. I haven't been, been in. But that was the start. So you, oh, you, did you put that on there too? That's what I said. We built that on when we built the back. Well, they sold cars out front right here. Had cars for sale. Oh, did you have like uh, used cars for the dealership out here too? Yep. Oh, sure so. did. It was, a, it was a pretty good, pretty good yeah. uh, shop when at you, the time. When you, yeah. when you built cars for Rick Wilson, you got the Oldsmobile deal. And you started building new cars, you had to have space. So this was right. a fab shop. Right. Right here that you built on this whole extension. Yeah. So this over here was fab shop when you started building cars. Yeah. All the way to the end. Well, this, this is not small. This is deceptively yeah. large. But you said it was just like a little two guard garage. I thought we were gonna, you well, know. We started and then an eight, you know, then added that. And Captain Cody's came and Osmobile, you know. Wow, this is neat. Did you do pit stop practices out here too? You know, at that time, I don't think we did. We didn't even practice, did we? No. <laughs> wow. But when we our pit crew, we just put them together from the, the people that we had uh, working on the race car all the time. And then we had Todd. Yeah, uh, worked at the dealership. My brothers, a couple of people worked at the dealership. That's why we went to the racetrack and we weren't very good, but <laughs> we looked good. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. So back then, pit stops weren't even a priority. You didn't even practice. Didn't practice. You're just like, well, we got to change the tires. We will. Yeah, but we, that's just, it. <laughs> we wanted to run fast. And we knew if we could run fast and then eventually last, we could get a sponsor. So that was the goal when you started, just to get a sponsor. To get a sponsor. We had a good sponsor, too. We, we had a couple. We had Folgers for a year. Then Rick Hendrick got that. Huh. He slicked that away from us. And then... Uh, we had uh, Kodak. Kodak. Well, you had Captain Cody. Captain Cody. Rick Wilson brought that. Yeah. He was friends with the restaurant guy. He, he was a restaurant guy down in Daytona. You move into this bigger building whenever Kodak came on, or did you move here and then Kodak showed up? Uh, actually, we we had Kodak, but we only had Kodak for uh, a certain amount of races. Oh. Uh. And then. Uh, we knew we were kind of outgrowing that facility. This became available, and we took another dive, hoping that we'd have some success and, and be, be able to keep the sponsor. But our first sponsorship deal was uh, for 10 races with Kodak. And it was a kind of an interesting deal how that all came down. How did, how did that facilitate <laughs> how did, in the first place? How did it trans they called us. Kodak had made a deal with a gentleman in uh, North Wilkesboro to run the season. And it being their first venture getting into NASCAR, they uh, paid all the money up front. Hmm. And they, they went to, uh, I'm thinking, about 10 races and didn't make one. So, uh, didn't qualify. So. They called us and we were running pretty good. And they called us and said, Hey, you interested in running, I think, five races? And he said, We might be, we'll talk to you. And uh, so we we made an appointment to go to Rochester. I took uh, Rick Wilson and our Oldsmobile rep. We'd be interested in doing this for you. But, it, but I asked him twice the amount of money that they had offered me. And I said, if you can't afford to do that, you, you don't need to be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, the guy got up out of the conference room and left. He didn't say, kiss my butt, anything, no, yes, whatever, he just <laughs> left. So we were staying across the road at the hotel suites. Went over there and was talking about our meeting and. Their PR guy from North Carolina was in the meeting. He didn't know what they were doing. Nobody knew anything. Thanks to Leather Honey for sponsoring today's video.
Much like Morgan McClare Motorsports, Leather Honey is a family owned and operated business based in Virginia. Since 1968, people who truly care about their leather have been trusting Leather Honey. Their American made products are premier, all natural, made for your daily leather care needs. Leather, faux leather, vinyl, plastic, rubber, basically any type of material that is inside the car you probably drive every day. Logan used this stuff on the interior of her new car, new to her car already, and it worked really, really well. See how it doesn't leave like a weird residue? Yeah, no, it does not. It's not oily or slick or, you know, you sit on some cleaners after you condition your seat and you, you like squeak around in it. It's just, you know, it makes you not want to clean the inside of your car with it because it's uncomfortable. Unlike other products on the market that just sit on the surface and evaporate quickly, Leather Honey Leather Conditioner is uniquely formulated to penetrate into the leather to hydrate each individual fiber, which means just one application can last six months or longer. Leather Honey understands the value of quality leather and how important it is to keep it looking like new. With thousands of five-star reviews, customers agree, making it the number one best-selling leather care products on Amazon. This is treated. This is untreated. You can see a former product actually left streaks on here. It didn't sink in. It just stayed on the surface. And the Leather Honey came out great. My fingers are not greasy or weird feeling. See all the ways Leather Honey's cleaner and conditioner can help prolong the life of your leather by clicking the link below. Enter my code STAPLETON20 to save 20% on your Leather Honey kit. So we flew home and Monday morning he called me up and said, let's do the deal. <laughs> so we did. And the first race we attempted to run for them was Michigan. And that same guy was there. He was responsible. And uh, he was on top of the truck when we qualified. And we, at that time, qualifying wasn't over when we went out, but it was mostly over with. I think we were eighth. He got off the top of that truck. He never did say, kiss my butt to anybody. He just went down that trailer and left. <laughs> and we said, wonder what the heck's going on? And he was so excited that we'd qualified for that race. And I asked him, I said, well, why, why did you want to get back to Rochester so fast? He said, that's the first time I've been able to go through the front door all year long. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went in with a big smile. So it was real good relationship with us. And we, we didn't win a race that year. We started in 90 with uh, Phil, Parsons. Phil Parsons. He ran four races and we let him go. And I guess I hired Rick, I mean Ernie then didn't mm -hmm. I? I called Junie Don Levy. I said, Junie, I'm, I'm in search of a driver. I said, I'd kind of like to talk to, to uh, Ernie. I said, you got everything worked out for this year? And he said, Buddy, I'm glad you called me. He said, we just had a meeting today. Our sponsor pulled out and is not going to pay us. So you're welcome to talk to him. So I called him up, talked to him, and asked him if he'd meet us in Atlanta. And that was for a pre-race uh, test session, open to any of the race teams. So uh, the weather, was very inclement and rain and rain most of the time. We were we stayed down there three days, and Ernie rode that tractor. He wore it out. One they used to take a brush and run around the racetrack to drive the racetrack. So he rode that thing, and we ended up getting about an hour's practice the third day. And he went out and made five laps and come in. And I said, "Well, we'll let you run in Atlanta." And we started uh, a provisional start. I'm thinking it was about 22nd or 3rd. And that was a position our car number had been the previous year. That's how they started us, huh. since it rained out qualifying. And uh, we started there and finished second. So. Before the next race, I'd signed him up for five years, which didn't mean a hill of beans, but he raced, he drove for us for two and a half years, I think. 
How did he end up getting out of his contract to go to Yates? What was he the mechanics told me, of that? He said, he said, you can't afford to keep me. I said, what do you mean? I was right down there in my attorney's office. He said, I'm in control of the gas pedal, the brake pedal, and the steering wheel. He said, I'll show you, you can't afford to keep me. And he did. We went to Bristol. That was a Bristol race weekend. And he uh, he wrecked three cars and blew up two or three motors. On so, purpose? Well, we had been pretty stable until then. So. Hmm. That's a gray area. That's a big gray area. Yeah. He probably doesn't remember any of that, but that's the way it happened. So, anyway. And then after that, what would, yeah. how did you tell him that he could leave? I didn't. I didn't tell him. I just. I don't know who would. I don't know who we told. Uh, but that we didn't need him anymore. So. I filled in with uh, two or three drivers. Uh, Nemechek. I hired Nemechek, didn't I, Todd? Yeah, Jeff. Let's see. Jeff Purvis. Yeah. And that didn't work out for us. So, uh, Ryan had been, my engine builder had been uh, buddies with Sterling. And, of course, I'd been buddies with Sterling. And so, the race team wanted to hire him. He, he hadn't won a race. And he was currently driving for Junior Johnson. So Ernie was gone after that that Bristol race with the. Ernie was gone after that Bristol race. Yep. And the next week was he in Yates' car. He was in Yates' car. Interesting. Remember after Allison got killed or in his helicopter thing, I called the Yates and offered to see if I could help him anyway. I didn't know. Uh, they'd go directly from a driver but they did and believe me when we started we had no idea that we were going to be successful we just wanted to have some fun hmm. how far into it did you get before you realized like okay maybe we could we could do something with this well when we got our first sponsor uh, we got Folgers and we knew we were going to have them for a year. We felt like that we we had a chance. So, and going through those periods, it was a growth period for us. Our drivers were probably better than we were, most of them. We decided we were going to be make a commitment to to having some success, and we did. And then the good Lord blessed us. So, big night in Bristol, our first race we won. What would you say your favorite time when, period was? Like from what year to year do you think was like the, the the top of the story when you were just when you were having the most fun? Oh, well, I'd say anywhere from 1992, 97, 98, 98. We're pretty good. We're pretty competitive. You know, I I, I can see where I made a lot of mistakes. Just, there was things that I could have done different. Uh, I had opportunities to have a second car. Didn't take them, didn't want to. Uh, I had opportunities we could move out of Abingdon. I didn't want to do that. And uh, just, I don't know, should have made some different choices. We spent a lot of money on our own engine program. And uh, after, after like the 90, 98 season somewhere along in there we just didn't have much success and I should have leased motors from or I mean Childers or, or uh, Hendrix that probably would have helped us you think the, the, right, the technology and resources of everything else in Charlotte was I growing it, faster it was than growing it. faster than we could we couldn't keep up with them we couldn't have 25 engineers we could we just didn't have the money and they saw a lot more. They uh, they had a lot uh, different materials in their engines, their valve springs, and things like that. So they were they were just ahead of us, and we couldn't catch up. So 
there for a while until they got all these engineers coming into NASCAR. Uh, we were able to work harder and, and compete, and work smarter and compete. But after a while, when they had all the money and all the engineers, and they had the best drivers and the best people, you can't compete with that. So, I guess it was probably my fault that, that uh, our racing went downhill. So if you could go back, would you move to Charlotte when you had the opportunity to move to Charlotte and uh, start a second car? It's certainly been something to consider, uh, but you know, NASCAR was always nice to us. They helped us, and uh, we were that single car team. And you just couldn't, you just couldn't do it. And, but like I said, we had some opportunities, and uh, actually, we were down in this little shop right down here. Our first opportunity. So we're almost there. We're mm -hmm. almost there, right around the curve. You know what's in there now? Uh, they store hospital merchandise. Huh. They bought it for a warehouse. So they bought it from you and they've been in there ever since? Yes. Right here's the food countries racing. They were neighbors. Oh wow. And then we had we were raced out of this shop right here. It's a nice building. So this is where the Daytona cars came from? This is where the Daytona car came from. Yep. This is a nice building. I bought. <laughs> Let's see. I bought this much of a building. <laughs> and I built onto there, and then I built onto there, and then went back. So the original building was there right to that. Right in the center. I can see that, yeah. Yeah. You remember that time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I remember. You had two buildings. Yeah, we ran. Tied them together. Uh, we ran. I think five show cars out of here, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So we housed them and took care of all the merchandise that we had for uh, several years. The engine shop was on this end. The yeah. shops came in. I hope they don't get us. So yeah. did you keep this building for show cars when you moved to the other? building? No, no, I sold this one. Okay. You can see where the fans for the dynos up there. Yeah. yeah. And was that where the, the pipes would come out the bottom yeah. the, when their water tanks back there? Yeah. Well, see that big pipe sticking up there? Yeah. It was an exhaust. Huh. And on out through there, there there's some that they cut off. But... That's funny. Yeah. The forensic evidence that people drive by this place and nobody would ever know. <laughs> no. Nope, nobody would ever know. Now this place, uh, that's a pretty good building. I mean, like they need to clean out the gutters, don't they? Mm -hmm. But they've taken pretty good care of it. They took that old awning off of it. Yeah. Todd. The 18 wheeler went in right there. Yeah, that's where we park it. So you, you could park the hauler inside this yeah. time? Yeah. We did her. Well, half of that building was her fab shop. Let me show you. There was one stall here we had her truck, and then it was separate. And then about right here back was the fab shop. It went all the way through, including the body shop. And then from this section to the front is where we did our, in our car assembly. Okay. You think you got a lot of room? You don't have anything, do you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, really. When you're having success and you yeah. grow like you do. Yeah. These people have got a nice place. But they've been there, you said they've been there ever since you moved into this place? Yep. Yeah, they've so been there since yeah. the 80s. Wow. Our, yeah. our old crew chief, Chris Carrier, works there. Yeah. Huh. If you ever want to get in there and do anything, I can set that up. Sure. They've probably got some cool old stuff in there if they've been there since the 80s. They have. And it's full of uh, 55, 6, and 7 Thunderbirds. Huh. He's probably got 25. You good this way. So this
this building was the museum. Mm -hmm. And that was open until when? 2005, probably. 2006. There's your three flagpoles. <laughs> yeah. The race shop flagpoles. Yeah. Recruiting center? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if they'll let us in or not. We'll find out. That fish will wash the checkered flag off. Or did you do that? I did that. Went over about halfway and then there's a, another storage room. Storage back. room. Well, the storage room back, but in the front here we had a place for to sell uh, souvenirs. souvenirs. Yeah. Oh. Hats, t shirts, whatever. Oh uh, yeah, you can see where it used to say McClure Motor Sales on it. Yeah. Yep. But, no, it was a nice, nice place. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That was the body shop right there, the middle building. Okay. Little building we kept our lawnmower in. Well, that little thing just for the lawnmower? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, there's a lot of offices in there. Oh yeah. What was going on in all that? Well, it seemed like everybody had to have an office. My brothers. That was the parts, uh, parts department uh, on this end. And then just past that was a hallway and then you, you went into where they assembled the engines. Huh. Machine shop and then the assembly was around. So there's probably a lot of equipment still left, like the fans and everything in there. You just took the cells out. Uh, yeah, that that's one cell right there. See where that building's been extended? Yeah. We had a fruit dyno in there. Huh. And, uh, we had plenty of room. So you sold it right to the the National Guard? I sold it to the state. Huh. Did you even have it for sale or did they just ask if they could buy it? Oh, I had it for sale. Oh. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that was really in big demand up here at the time. You owned the entire Finston area? Yeah. So you could have added more on if you wanted to oh, anytime? Oh yeah, we could add another race shop on were you doing pit stop practice by this time? Oh yeah. <laughs> Here, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a wall out back. Yeah. Did you do pit stop practice at the other place too? Down down there. The second a little, one, yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Nothing like here. But you know, I guess now everybody just rents their pit crew. Don't they? I don't even know. They're all like former college athletes or football players or something now, it seems like. We come down here and drive our cars. Not down this road here. I was going to ask if you did that. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good find. A lot of race cars down this road right here. Super yeah. fast. Did you make some test runs through here? Oh, yeah. No one cared. <laughs> well, they, they may have. They didn't say anything. We didn't. <laughs> Nobody. There were noise ordinances too. And, Nobody ever raised hell. Operating on faith is when we bought this building. Really? Yeah. We had that one down there and we decided to do this. So. So you had that one first? The museum no, building? No, the first one down there beside the oh. country. Oh. Yeah. So it took a year and a half to build this. Wow. concrete block and steel, you know, steel roofing. We had uh, an air system that took care of all the buildings. Like those screw type compressors, have you seen them? Uh-uh. Kaiser. Kaisers. See, how many BTU of air conditioning does that take to do all that? <laughs> Ah, but then I don't find out. But we even we, we even had in the compressor room we had we were using the heat coming out of that room in 
in the wintertime to help heat the building. Really? Yeah. That's funny. In the summertime, we had fans that you know, they'd open up and take the heat out. What was that yellow? It was like Wheatland Yellow? Is that what it was called? Wheatland Yellow. Yeah, Chevrolet. How many gallons of that stuff do you think you use over the years? Oh my God, I have no idea. <laughs> A lot. Like every car was the same color for... Well, that was the longest running sponsor for, for a long time. Kodak was. With the same team. Does Kodak even exist anymore? Yeah. Yeah, they, they exist. I don't know what they do. They just got... You know, the digital world passed them by. But they were great people to us. I'll tell you that. They were nice. So now we're going to go back to we'll your shop back now. To the yeah. And we'll get to see Sterling's 95 Daytona car. Yes. Heard a lot about that car. That's going to be cool. It's a pretty cool car. We, uh, we wrecked this car. Actually, Ernie hit us and knocked us into Earnhardt in 96. 96, Talladega. We had to rebuild this car. We rebuilt it the same engine, all that stuff. Make sure you're subscribed if you made it this far and you're not already. You definitely should be, because I know you wouldn't watch this whole video if you weren't like all about this 80s, 90s, early 2000s NASCAR history stuff. There's a lot on the channel that is right up your alley, if that's the case. We also went to Larry's house, where he has the intake manifold and cylinder heads from Ernie Irvin's 1991 Daytona 500 car. We take them out, put them on the floor, and look at all the little nooks and crannies of the cylinder heads and intake manifold. Like, they are the real deal, the ones that came off the car. They got the weird, you just, the stuff that makes a restrictor plate int intake manifold special. It's all still in there. We're glad you're here, because if you're still here, that means you're into all the same stuff we are, and we like you, so. Welcome to the team.